In the spring of 1919, a group of diplomats from the victorious Entente powers, after months of deliberation and argument, finally came to an agreement. The Treaty of London would be honored and Italy shall dominate the Adriatic. During the three long years between 1915 and 1918, over 500,000 Italians had died in numerous costly and strategically unsound offensives and disastrous offensive failures. These constant failures had led to Italy never achieving the type of results the Entente powers had hoped for when they signed the Treaty of London in 1915. Historically, this became known as a mutilated victory, for the sheer cost and destructiveness of the war, for so little gain, became a rallying cry for extremists on both sides of the spectrum. During this time, shortly after the war, the Italian state began to essentially collapse from within. In an attempt to maintain stability and morale during the war, the Italian government had promised its soldiers the vote once the war had ended. This had come back to haunt them in the end, as these soldiers were easily radicalized, many of them were radicalized to the left, and during the next Italian election, no party could form an effective governing majority in the Italian parliament, creating a political deadlock. Political violence became normalized with radicalized workers and soldiers returning home to rapidly decreasing job opportunities, the socialist and communist parties in Italy declaring general strikes and armed themselves sometimes barricading themselves and leading to increasingly escalating violence. Now, in order to suppress the communists that were increasingly coming closer to a Russian-style revolution to overthrow the government, the Italian government called upon the radical right militias to pretend the radicals that had long since gotten too far out of control for the government to handle it themselves. But this was never destined to happen. In the end, it was the whims of Paris and London that had the most say in the destiny of nations in the post-war world. And they decided to not give what they promised to Italy and instead reward Serbia. So what if it didn't happen? What if Italy had gotten what it was promised instead and the mutilated victory never happened? Now starting off, without the political disaster that was a mutilated victory, Italy is immediately more stable. With the additional land, the likelihood is that the government, in order to make their new territories more Italian, is able to uphold their promise of land and devote to returning soldiers. Although the amount of people who redeem that land is unclear, as the land is likely of poor quality and may lead to some unrest anyway. Of course, with the Treaty of London honored, relations with the Western Entente powers, England and France, were not strained by the peace like they were in real life. This could even mean that Italy in the interwar era is a member of the Little Entente, or at least an ally of it. Of course, not all the spaghetti and meatballs for the Kingdom of Italy after the war. Despite increased stability and support for the government, two issues remain. With the rise of Russian communists and the large unemployment rate that would still exist after the war, the rise of Italian socialism was still going to happen, especially made worse by the increased voting base after the war, which was going to cause an increasingly unstable Italian government, making the Italian victory in World War I more like the French victory. Now the second issue is the Ottoman lands promised to Turkey in the 1915 Treaty of London. The vast majority of lands and influence areas promised to Italy would be still in Turkey as the odds being that after such a costly war in the Alps, the Italian people, much like the British and the French people, would not have the will to pursue the war in Anatolia to victory. Although there is a chance they would secure a few more lands than in real life, this, however, leave a poor taste and continue to destabilize the Italian state, causing Turkish-Italian tensions during the interwar period. While in real life the Italian government opposed German invasion of Austria, in this scenario Italian objections still exist. However, they are a lot less loud as a primary motion for Italian objections was that Italy wanted to take Austria for itself and Mussolini. In this scenario, however, 
Rome objects on the basis that now an expansionist Germany is placed directly upon the Italian-Austrian border in the north. Despite Italian objections, nothing is done about Germany. However, the Italian government in Rome may start improving its military position. However, this will be far later than would be necessary and would most likely start slow until the Munich Conference. The Munich Conference was truly a disaster for the members of the Entente, which may have included Italy, as it showed France had no interest in defending the members of the Little Entente in order to cause Italy any remaining military alliance to France, seeing it as a liability. With the embarrassment of the German violation of the Munich Agreement and the collapse of the Entente, France and the United Kingdom once again strengthened their military ties and were preparing for war and promised to put their foot down if Germany invaded Poland. It is possible that the French and British are able to reluctantly convince the Italians to also guarantee Poland's freedom in exchange for security guarantees and most likely some equipment and money. It is likely that liberal Italy may be opposed to German expansion, just like the French and British public were at this time, especially with the many violations of agreements However, the invasion of Poland would certainly be enough to convince the Italian public that Germany had to be stopped and Italy would mobilize shortly after, sending troops to man the Alpine border with Germany. No matter if Italy was in the war or not, Poland would have fallen just as it did in real life, quickly and shocking the world with the speed of the German advance and then the Soviet-German alliance. With Italian help or not, the French would have fallen and the British would have retreated from Dunkirk. However, it is very likely that a much larger portion of the French army is able to escape across the border to Italy as well as many civilians. However, what becomes different now is where the Western Front ended quickly in a few months. The key to Germany's victory in France is our armored divisions, who would become practically useless in the rough Italian Alps. All it would take is one good defensive victory in the incredibly easy to defend Alps to convince the Italian public to stay in the line. However, it is unclear how long Italy could hold out. Italian industrial capabilities would struggle to keep up with the demand of ammunition and equipment by the Italian forces on the front. It would be by now that the Germans fighting the British in the air, across the channel and the Italians on the ground in the Alps would either break through the Alpine defensive line somehow or would seize their offensives, most likely the latter, as especially the early years of the war, the Germans were paranoid of high casualty and high attritional losses on equipment as the German high command planned for Operation Barbarossa. If Italy had joined the Allies, there is very large chance that when France surrendered to Vichy, France would be placed under occupation and only allowed to operate as a puppet government under occupation, like they did in the last few months of existence. This would mean a free France suddenly becomes an instantly legitimate French government and exile, as which France is never allowed to self-govern leading to North Africa, like staying with the Allies, meaning the North African Front may just never happen. And if North Africa stayed with Vichy France, Royal and Italian navies would easily just blockade them into submission, and the Germans would never even attempt an invasion of Africa. Badly needed supplies will begin to restock the Italian army and restore their offensive and defensive capabilities just as happened with the British army. While an offense taken by the Allies at this stage would surely be slow and difficult and require heavy fighting and the Germans likely dug in along the Alps like the Austrians did in the First World War, it would be a matter of time before the amphibious attack along the southern French coast instead of Operation Torch or a breakthrough forces the Germans to pull back, meaning the Allies will be able to defeat Germany perhaps a few months to a year earlier than in our own timeline.